that kind of leads me into introducing uh, Nicole Denman. Um, Nicole, tell us a little bit about yourself and your, and your firm. Hi, Scott. Thanks. Thanks first for having me. I do appreciate it. Well, great to have you. My name is Nicole Denman. And I'm a Stetson uh, College of Law graduate here awesome. locally. Um, I founded Denman and Denman with Christian Denman. That's my husband in 2010. Um, we practice in a vari- variety, excuse me, of different practice areas. Uh, we have three offices in the Tampa Bay area here in Hillsborough, Pinellas, and Pasco County as well. Um, our two biggest practice areas, which hopefully I'll get to talk a little bit about both today, one of them's divorce and the other one's estate planning. And I hope to kind of touch on that. I know we're here to talk about divorce, but people forget about the estate planning aspect of divorce as well. So hopefully Well, that's a big part of it, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I can't tell people often enough. I mean, I had my will, estate, everything done when I was in my early 30s. As soon as I had children, we had our estate planning done. Mm-hmm. Now, when Nicole and I met, I, I, it reminded me that it's been a long time since I've looked at my stuff and I need to relook at it. But it's very important, and especially when you're going through something like a divorce and there's children involved, estate planning is crucial. So Absolutely, absolutely. And, and people don't think about it, although divorce is a life-altering event. And I say every life-altering event, you need to think about the estate planning stuff. So, But we'll touch on that. Let's talk about the divorce stuff first because I know we want to touch on that. Part. Yeah, so, so a lot of people going through a divorce own at least one residence or property jointly with their spouse. So what happens with that jointly owned property during the divorce? Okay. So first let's talk about jointly owned property because some people think, oh, okay, I found out I'm not on the, the deed to the property. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not mine. Okay. So we have a lot of, of particularly wives that go through that. Maybe husband is taking care of the financials. He's been the, he's been the breadwinner. And somehow he ends, ends up on the deed to the property. That does not necessarily mean that you are not entitled to a portion of that property. If the property was acquired during the marriage, then it is, in fact, marital property. And the courts can address it and deem it marital property, whether or not your name is on the deed at all. At all. Right. Um, also, if the property was acquired prior to being married, so perhaps there's a wife and she had a condo or something to that effect prior to the marriage and then gets married, but after the marriage, the, both the husband and wife contributed to the mortgage payments and things of that nature for the condo and expenses, then the wife is also, or and the husband, are both going to be entitled to a portion of that property as well. Then part of it is deemed marital property. Okay. See, now I didn't even know that. Mm-hmm. And you know, one thing that comes into play that I run into, and it's kind of an unfortunate situation, when we have those people that are in the midst of a divorce, in the state of Florida, you're either married or you're divorced. There's no really such thing as legal separation. So what I run into a lot in the mortgage industry is people are going through a divorce. They've already kind of split up, and divorce can take a long time in certain situations. They've moved out. They have separate homes, and one spouse wants to go buy a property. Well, if you're still married, that becomes a very difficult proposition, especially if you don't have a good relationship with that soon-to-be ex because in the state of Florida, we're a marital state, a spousal state. You cannot buy an owner-occupied piece of property in the state of Florida without your spouse being involved in that transaction. So it becomes very difficult. And that's a hard conversation to have with people. I've had to have that conversation twice this week. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. People think it's going to be really easy. I'm separated, per se. We're not living in the same residence. I right. can go out and do what I want. Yeah. No. You, you can, but you have to have your spouse sign off on everything yeah. as well yeah. still until you're deemed divorced by the court. Right. So and, and, I, you know, once again, it goes back to that that integrity thing. You know, I, I, I want to get people into homes. I want to do mortgages because that's how I make a living. But, you know, my advice to most people is wait till you're divorced. Get the divorce finalized. Go buy your property. It's free. It's clean. And you can move on with your life. Mm-hmm. So, So what happens when there is equity in the home and either the husband or wife remain in the home? Well, let's kind of backtrack a little bit. First, okay. I want to talk about, and, and then we'll get to that because I don't, I don't think I quite finished up. That's probably my fault. Okay. Um, but if if you are going to, if the court's going to divide your marital property for you, um, they can do basically three different things. The first thing they can do is they can force the sale of the home, right? Or the parties can agree, right? So parties can agree to anything, the sale of the home, right. and then the equity is divided or the liability is divided, whatever there is. Um, The the third thing that can be done is the court, as you said, Scott, is they can allow one party to remain in the property. And that's where it gets kind of tricky. You advised, hey, let's go ahead and sell the property. In ideal world, every divorce I did, I would advise that. But sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. But if there is equity in the home, that leads to the next question. 
Um, what can the court do? Well, the court can say, well, I, in one party stays in the home, uh, then the court can then say, well, I'm going to allow wife perhaps to stay in the home um, because there are minor children. She's the primary custodian of the minor children. That's a situation that occurs quite frequently and quite often. Or dad, right? Right, makes sense. Whichever one is the primary custodian. Um, but there's $50,000 in equity in the home. So what do we do? How do we credit dad his $25,000 of that $50,000? Well, you have to go into the other assets, right? So basically, dad would be getting a credit from the other assets of an additional $25,000. So basically, we'd be reaching into something else that is jointly owned property in order to give dad a credit to offset the equity in the marital home because one party wants to or because the court ordered one party to stay in the marital home. Like maybe a retirement account or something like that they could pull from? Correct. IRA, annuity, retirement account, 401k, anything of that nature. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, would it be possible, and this this was, of course, mortgage guy thinks, right? Like a mortgage guy. (laughs) What if that spouse was going to stay in the house and they've got enough equity? Why not just do a cash out refinance? If there's enough equity, Mm -hmm. you keep the house. You're killing two birds with one stone. Mm-hmm. You're giving the spouse their cash, their 25000 in that scenario, plus you're doing it in your name. You're getting the spouse off the loan, off the mortgage. At that point in time, you can make sure it in divorce it says they have to file a, sign a quick claim deed and get that person off of there. Absolutely. Right. And you know what? Anybody can agree to anything during a divorce. That's right. the best case scenario, and I wish everybody did. Unfortunately, they don't. And I right. don't know why the courts don't do that more, why judges don't order that more. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, they don't. Maybe they just don't think of it. But absolutely, if you have a financial savvy couple, I've seen that happen time and time again. Gotcha. Gotcha. So what happens if the home is underwater? More is owed on the mortgage than the home is worth, and one party remains in the home. And, and unfortunately... You know, we saw we saw a downturn in our market the last ten years or so. That 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 situation is probably more common than we'd like to see. Absolutely, I think it's getting better in the last few years. But I, it, I mean, it, it was really bad there for a period of time. Um, what basically happens is, is if there is a liability, the same thing that would happen with an equity, but in the reverse. So one party gets an offset from the marital assets for the liability. So maybe um, husband stays in the home, but there's a $100,000 liability on the home, um, which I don't know why they would choose to do that, but some people do have that emotional attachment to the home yeah. or want to stay in the home. Mm-hmm. But there's a $100,000 liability, so they have to be paid $50,000 or half of that liability, the wife's liability, from somewhere. So it comes from a different asset. Hmm. Um, Now, on the other hand, there is the foreclosure and short sale issue because a lot of the people that we're dealing with are in the midst of foreclosure or short sale because part of the reason they're getting divorced is is financial issues. They can't agree on finances. They're having issues. Unfortunately, that's the cause of many divorces. So. What do we do then? Well, when there's a foreclosure or a short sale, oftentimes, and and I think this is a great scenario for many people, one party will actually stay in the home until the foreclosure or the short sale is complete. And that way that party can continue to live in the home, although they're not making mortgage payments per se, they're living in the home for free at that point until the home is actually foreclosed upon or a short sale occurs. Um, once that happens, then there's a liability, obviously, and then the courts retain jurisdiction to make sure that that liability is split between the parties. And hopefully while that person is living in the home without making mortgage payments, they're saving that money and setting themselves up for future purchases or whatever the case may be. And we did a show about three or four weeks ago regarding negative financial events and how they affect your ability or capacity to be able to purchase a home in the future. Um, and if you have any questions on that and specific guidelines, I mean, we do have it. I have an investor right now. If you've got 20 percent down one day out of bankruptcy, one day at a short sale, one day out of a foreclosure, you can go get a mortgage and buy a house. Now, obviously, 20% is a lot of money for most people. You know, if you start talking about, you know, a $200,000 house, $40,000 is not chump change. That's a lot of money. So it becomes a very kind of specific scenario. But, you know, the, the moral of the story is there's there's options there for you. Tampa Bay.emmloans.com. We're, we're always there to answer your questions and help you out with that. Um, what occurs if a party cannot refinance only in their name? That's a tricky question because – Ideally, we all agree that one party is going to stay in the home, the other party, that party is going to refinance the mortgage in their name. Because once once you split, you don't want that obligation anymore. Unfortunately, though, as you were talking about, Scott, at the beginning of the show, 
that's not always possible. So right. oftentimes we have a party in the home that their salary is not high enough, um, their credit's not good enough. They just can't potentially refinance the home that they're in when they make thirty thousand or forty thousand dollars a year, and the mortgage on the home that's existent is two hundred thousand dollars. It's just not a possibility. Um, and unfortunately, the person that's on the other person that's on the mortgage is just going to end up stuck on that mortgage. Right. And the reason is, is because the courts and the, what the case law says is that, look, we can't intervene. We would like to. It's fair for us to intervene. But what are we going to do if a person is making their best efforts? Obviously, they would have to show that in court. Look, I've gone to this many places. I've I've applied for the refinancing and I just can't get it. Then there's nothing we can do because we can't force the bank into refinancing. Right, right. They've got or the mortgage. Company. Right, they, right. They, they've got to qualify for the loan at some point in time, and if they don't qualify, unfortunately, they're they're they, you know, mm-hmm. stuck between a rock and a hard place. You know, exactly. You, you, there's you know, there's only so much you can do in that situation. Mm-hmm. Now, once again, you go back to that divorce, that settlement agreement. The good news is for that spouse that is stuck on that mortgage. If the settlement agreement is very clear and concise that the other spouse that got the property is responsible for that mortgage, there's always a good chance, there's a very good chance that we do not have to count that into their overall debt-to-income ratios. Now, if that other spouse stops making the mortgage payments or anything like that, it could still have a negative impact on their overall credit. But from a lender standpoint, we get it and we understand, especially in today's market, that there's a lot of situations like that out there where that that spouse that kept the property and is court ordered to refinance, well, they just can't. They're either mm-hmm. upside down or underwater or they, they don't qualify. So, you Absolutely. know, we're, we don't want to penalize the other spouse for that situation. And, and I see it all the time. I mean, oh, I do yeah. see people that are, end up, they're just stuck. Yep. Um, they knew that might happen, but they, they attempted, the other party has attempted to refinance. They're stuck on the mortgage, but then they turn around and within a few months they have another mortgage. So it does happen. It's, yeah. it's not absolutely preventative of them yeah. getting another mortgage. It's not the end of the world. Right. Usually there's, mm-hmm. there's some options there. Mm-hmm. Um, are there any action, are there other actions that should be taken after divorce in regards to a property retained during divorce? Absolutely. And that's where we get into those estate planning documents I was yeah. talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Because we're talking about deeds, we're talking about mortgages, we're talking about taking your name. And I think we we did mention briefly, one party needs to go ahead and quit claim their portion over their interest over to the other party if that's what they're going to do and relinquish their interest and that party's going to stay in the home. But we also need to focus on the estate planning documents. A quit claim deed is actually considered a quasi-estate planning document as well. Hmm. So um, the estate planning documents, I'm talking about last will and testament designation of healthcare surrogate, living will, all of those things. Because you have to remember, even if you're doing all these things and taking the person off of the quit claim deed and they're no longer your spouse, if you're leaving these things to the per- this person or your ex-spouse in your will, right. you have to remove that person and put somebody else in their place because otherwise nobody's going to intervene. They're just going to assume that you had a, a great relationship with your ex-husband and you wanted to continue to leave these items and these things to your ex. So that's really, really important. And the healthcare documents, okay. because why would you want to have your ex go ahead and make your health care decisions for you? Well, that's great. Listen, Nicole, I want to thank you for coming in today. You've given us, given us a lot of great information. I hope nobody has to go through a divorce, but if they do, Denman and Denman uh, Law Firm, they're available for you. Reach out to them. They're easy to find on the internet. We'll be back in just a few minutes.